breaking down everyday workplace issues and diagnosing the hidden sickness, not just the obvious symptom, our hosts, James and Kobe. Did we lose a patient? No, that's just my lunch. Hey, thanks for joining us. I'm Kobe. He's James. So let's get started with a question. What are some risks and opportunities with wellness in the workplace? Yeah, well, first of all, welcome to season two of Diagnosing the Workplace, not just an HR podcast. Uh, we're excited to be in officially in our second season. Um, we've had phenomenal response and you uh, listening are fantastic for putting up with us for an entire year. So congratulations to you too. Um, but in all seriousness, let you know, talking about the um, wellness in the workplace is a huge deal and really important because wellness affects so many different things. So first of all, I want to talk about a little bit and just when we're talking about wellness in the workplace, we're, we're focusing on the actions that an organization takes to promote positive physical, emotional, and mental health. And the most important part of the definition is the word and. And this is one of the areas that I see a lot of mistakes being made is that organizations, if they are looking at how to provide better wellness supports, they oftentimes look at one of the aspects of wellness as physical health or emotional health or mental health. And all three really need to be present to take care of or to provide wellness or to improve the wellness of our employees. So what are the risks and opportunities? I think, generally speaking, the, the major risk is to undervalue or underestimate the direct impact that wellness has on productivity and profitability. And I think the great opportunity we have with, with wellness right now is that, honestly, it what doesn't take an awful lot to set yourself above and apart from your competition by providing wellness supports that actually improve the physical, emotional, and mental health of your employees. There's a great opportunity right now to, as wellness, mental health, physical health, emotional health is hugely important and a major priority for um, employees, for job seekers. When we're looking for new opportunities, these things are kind of a, a key aspect that people want and are craving in their jobs. So if you can capitalize on this, you can set yourself apart from the competition and really help your talent attraction and retention efforts. Yeah, and that's that's absolutely 100% true about there is there is a golden opportunity to really take this stuff seriously. And I think the key to doing that is going to be thinking about the and, you know, about yeah. the physical, the emotional and and and, and the mental health all combined. But I mean, because I mean, wellness and like burnout have become like major workforce topics, especially in the last few years. Like they've always been important, but it's something that has always been, it's always been needed, but it's but it's not always been wanted by businesses as, as a solution for it. But I mean, like, you know, like we've seen the pop up of, you know, lots of, you know, uh, great wellness consultants, a lot of like, um, New businesses in the tech sector are popping up around trying to find wellness solutions. Uh, we've been kind of a part of supporting the kind of promotion of a workforce wellness conference hosted by Reuters Events. We've been doing some stuff. Um, like I moderated a uh, webinar to kind of promote the um, the fall the, this, this fall like conference event um, with 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 Reuters Events. And I mean, you know, like, and we are we are very. Um, we really do care about wellness in the workplace and workforce wellness, because like it's something that we don't often talk about in the podcast as its own topic. I think this is the first time we've really kind of carved out wellness as being its own standalone topic. We often talk about things that 
will improve wellness. Like we talk mm-hmm. about managing expectations has a great um, role in reducing a lot of stress and anxiety when it comes to people figuring out kind of more, more of their emotional health around what their managers expect of them. We talked about things like a limited PTO in, in, in last season, um, you know, you know, how that can actually impact, you know, burnout and improve wellness. So we talk about it a lot in the context of through other topics, but I am really excited to kind of dig into wellness kind of as its own topic um, for the podcast. And I think that's something that, again, we take very seriously, but we also, I'm very excited that businesses have always needed support with, with their workforce wellness, but it seems like in the past few years now they want support with it. And that's been kind of the difference is that they've always needed it, but they didn't want it. I, Yes. I'm not sure that it's a want as much as it's uh, it's no longer an option. Uh, it's no longer, um, you can no longer approach wellness as work is work, home is home, leave your home life at home. Right. Right. Which traditionally has been a very common approach. Uh, many businesses have taken is I don't really care what's going on in your personal life. You have a job to do, so leave that crap at the door and just do your job. That, it's always, that's never really been the most productive um, way to engage in this conversation, but it has been a very common way that many businesses have engaged. Um, I don't know, I suspect this started beforehand, but as with many things that we talk about, COVID was really a catalyst for the, it's no longer an option to discuss. We now need to actually figure out how do we address this? Because COVID took a huge toll on physical, emotional, and mental health. Mm -hmm. Worldwide pandemic, lockdowns, people like the the fear, the anxiety, the stress um, that came with that took a massive toll collectively on how on our wellness as a society, as individuals, as businesses. And I really don't see it as an optional piece anymore. Yeah. It's something, it is a core factor of your workplace. And if you are not properly accounting for this core factor of your workplace, you will suffer the consequences. You will suffer increased burnout. You will mm-hmm. suffer increased turnover and you will suffer from general, generally lower productivity. Like it's just. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're right that again, and this is going, going back to, this has always been a need. Like it's always been an important topic, but it's, but I think you're right. The COVID really propelled this to the front of the national conversation. And it also really, um, put a spotlight on the impact that it has when we don't really take care because everyone's wellness dropped dramatically, mm-hmm. and it and it, it almost took something that significant for everyone to stop and take notice of. Wow, this has been kind of slowly eroding our workplaces, but now we see w- what happens. You know, kind of what happens all, all at once. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like we say, this has been an important topic, before, like you know, pre-COVID. Like um. There's a stat that we use in some of our training from GCC Insights that talks about, um, you know, uh, it, it, even before pre-COVID, yeah. employees would take an average of four sick days a year, but admit to being unproductive an average of 57.5 days a year. That's so it's huge. It is. So like, yeah. so like they, you know, they, it's almost like they weren't sick enough to stay home, but they came in and really just tried to push their way through it. So they, they were present, but they weren't productive. And this is the this is the term that we use, or this is the definition that we kind of use for the term presenteeism. So absenteeism is people being being you know emotionally, mentally, and physically um, burned out and not able to, to go to work. Presenteeism is when they're physically, emotionally, and mentally burned out, but showing up anyway. Right. Right. So it's so it's important to realize that, you know, this, you know, so we talk about burnout um, 
in some of our training and some of our webinars, but we usually talk about it in, in terms or in relation to presenteeism, you know, that, that I'm sick, I can't work, but I'm showing up anyway. And that and and that expectation of people, well, I don't care if you're on death's door, you need to go to work. That is one of those pre-existing kind of mindsets that almost like let's burn out and, and poor wellness erode our workplaces. Well, if people can't afford to take time off to recover, or if there there if there are not the supports in place for them to be able to um disconnect from work or to adequately address their physical emotional and mental health then yeah they're just going to keep going into work because they need a paycheck right right mm -hmm. i mean look at the buzzwords that have cropped up um around in, in the last couple of years the great resignation was mm -hmm. largely uh the catalyst for a lot of that was the changing expectations as people realized that the workplace the factors of the workplace were just in many respects, not meeting their expectations. They were not competitive, sufficient, and equitable, right. and which was causing undue stress and hardship and causing a lot of problems around their physical, emotional, and mental health, right? Yep. These major, major um, topics that you know have had academics and professionals discussing for years at this point have a direct relationship with wellness supports yeah. with the way that we provide for the physical emotional and mental health of our employees yeah and one of the things that kind of always comes to mind to me when we really kind of see how we've traditionally undervalued wellness as being kind of an essential component to employee productivity and the employee experience is, I mean, we kind of give as an example like this when we talk about um, kind of human capital versus um, capital when it comes to thinking about, about employees as expenses and assets. But in, in, in a similar way of thinking about it, um, like we, like companies have maintenance departments, departments that support our equipment. We have like engineers and we have like, you know, IT and we have people that, you know, like, like, like maintain our trucks and maintain our equipment and, you know, make sure that they're not over, they're not misused or overused and that, and, and that we're not wearing them out and that we're, you know, giving them the rest or, or, or fixing the, the parts that get broken in order to maintain productivity. We have, you know, often a big portion of our company expenses are in equipment maintenance, maintenance departments mm -hmm. and the functional role. But wellness is like the maintenance department, but for people, right? It's about the idea of looking after the, the mental, physical, and emotional health of people is kind of the same in the same way that we take care of the, you know, the, the physical and the um, all the other aspects of, of equipment. I won't lie. I'm not very handy. I don't really know how you, <laughs> how you fix stuff. So I'm actually, I, I, I might lose myself in this analogy, but, but I do want to make the point that there is this idea that we, in, we invest in maintaining our equipment and keeping them as well running as we can, but we should be putting the same type of investment into the wellness of our people to keep them as well running as we can. Yeah. I mean, we preventative medicine, whether you're talking from a healthcare perspective, we know that, uh, well, what's the old uh, saying? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, um, right? Mm -hmm. Like we know that if we invest more in uh, preventative um, supports, that we will reap the benefits of that on the other end. I mean, that's why we have maintenance departments, right? You to take care of the equipment and machinery because it is ultimately uh, cheaper and better for us to make sure that the equipment runs properly for a long period of time than to ignore it, have something break and have to replace that uh, expensive piece of machinery. Now, many people may not appreciate being compared to an inanimate object. And if so, well, I apologize half-heartedly. Um <laughs> Anyway. No one wants to be thought of as a photocopier. <laughs> yeah, but the analogy is not a bad one, right? Because we need to do preventative medicine 
for ourselves, right? We, we need to take care of our physical health because if we take care of our physical health, we will have more energy. We will be healthier. We will live longer. We will be happier. We need to take care of our emotional health and our mental health for the exact same reasons. Preventative is always going to be less expensive than having to fix the problem when something goes wrong on the other side. And that's where your wellness supports should be focusing on. What can we do as an organization to help people in their preventative, um, right? You yeah. may have some supports that actually do address some of the other side of things. So, I mean, with some, um, you know, um, health benefit programs, there may be, uh, you know, supports for, you know, uh, therapy or for, um, you know, different mental health or physical health or emotional health supports to kind of get you back into where uh, a healthy standpoint should be. But there also, there needs to be something to help people to break the cycle of, <laughs> or to um, rest and recharge or to um, become like just, even small things like taking a break through the day, um, whether that is a, you know, doing some sort of physical activity, whether that is a, um, you know, guided meditation or yoga or stretching or whatever is going to respond to the individual, these things can be incredibly powerful. And it's, it is the employer's responsibility now to not do everything. You can't force people to take a break. You can't, well, you can in some situations. You can't force people though to take advantage of some of the benefits programs or to take, to engage uh, fully in different initiatives that you've developed. But it is your responsibility to look at how can you provide the opportunity for people to engage in preventative care. Yeah, well, and one of the things though that I do find in companies that are really trying to improve wellness is they tend to kind of fall into a bit of the trap of what is the easiest to implement and what is the easiest to measure, right? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, you know, those, those two things are, are important, but they end up becoming almost like those are, th that, that's not a bad strategy to talk about the lowest hanging fruit and what you sh should you do first. But the problem is a lot of them don't move beyond that. Because like, like physical health is something that's a little bit easier to kind of conceptualize and measure. Like, you know, we have a running club or we do like, you know, we, we put, you know, um, exercise equipment in the break room or we, or we purchase um, gyms, uh, you know, like gym memberships and stuff like that. So, and, and whoever takes advantage of those kinds of things, that's a bit easier. Mental health um, is a is also a bit easier. It's not quite as easy, in my opinion, as physical health. But like, you know, you can access, you know, experts around um, counseling and, mm -hmm. and and kind of therapeutic days and 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 also incorporate more wellness days and stuff like that. But one of the hardest ones to really measure and to really ensure kind of that that short term win is with emotional health, because a lot of what robs our emotional health is often the daily interactions. It's things like right. you know our the the morale of the organization. It's things like the interpersonal relationships that we have with our coworkers and with our boss. It's the stress that, you know, it's, it's a lot of the stress that we feel when we don't have, or we don't know how, we don't have clear expectations about what's expected of us, or if we feel like we're being, we're being picked on or those yeah, types yeah. of things. So it's kind of the idea of, you know, some companies see, okay, our wellness numbers are, are bad. So let's, you know, let's put treadmills and salads in the break room. But you can't treadmill and salad your way out of workplace problems around poor expectations or around harassment or those types of things. So this is why when you said at the beginning, you know, physical, emotional and mental health, the and is so important is we have to realize that they're not going to all be easy to implement, but they're all important on their own. We have to look at it from all of them if you really want to move the needle on wellness. And I, I like what you said there because there's... In that is the the classic mistake of thinking of wellness as a siloed or as an as one singular thing, as mm -hmm. we are going to do a wellness initiative. But if you look at the emotional side, I mean the stress, the emotional um, damage that can come from 
working under a manager who's a micromanager or who is only looking out for their own self-interest or, you know, working in an environment that is uh, toxic or caustic at the uh, very least. These take on, a, these take a huge emotional toll on the people who have to experience this, which is why when we're talking about wellness, we're not just talking about uh, break rooms, healthy eating, fitness challenges, um, you know, encouraging people to take breaks. Like there's lots of great things that you can do, but it needs to also be spread through all of what you do in your organization, your operations, the way that you uh, provide training and support to your managers, because it, your managers should be the ones taking care of their teams, yeah. right? They should be looking out for the best interest and reporting back on, okay, you know, we're struggling right now and we need X, Y, and Z, right? The, the role that the direct manager or supervisor has on the emotional well-being of their team is huge, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's yeah. we've been using the same type of language for years around, you know, people don't quit jobs, they quit managers, right? right. This idea that the direct supervisor, the manager, the boss, whomever that authority figure is, if they are not properly trained and supported, to understand the role that they have in in over somebody's emotional and uh, mental health and how it's a trust that they have been given that they need to be re that they need to be responsible for and the way that they handle that trust says a tremendous amount about that the integrity of that person yeah no, and, and you're right. And the thing too is, is again, the not consider, we, we have to consider, and this is why, you know, we always talk about how impactful workplace culture is to organizational performance and productivity, because this is exactly, this is exactly it, right? Like, um, and, and one of the things that, you know, when we talk about this concept with individual businesses, you know, the idea, well, you know, making those types of investments into manager training or into improving kind of a more holistic part of wellness. Those are expensive things that we don't know, mm -hmm. you know, you know, we, we, we don't know if we can spend that kind of money. And one of the things that we, that we say back to them is we say, well, you are already spending that kind of money because of labor value loss, right? The financial impact of, of these, of these common workforce and staffing challenges. Because, because again, according to um, Morneau Chappelle, the cost of burnout-related absence and loss of productivity can be close to twenty-five percent of an employee's salary. So, if you have a hundred thousand-dollar employee who is burned out every, you know, you know, for for for, for two years, each year that's costing you twenty-five percent of their salary, two or twenty-five thousand dollars in low productivity and absences. So that is, you know, so that is money you were already spending. You were already mm -hmm. paying that. But if you could divert some of that into being more into the more preventative medicine, then, you know, and that you, then you'll start to see things turn around. But that, and again, that's just one employee. If you if all your employees are, then you're talking, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars being wasted. Chances are if you've got well in any organization guarantee you, you've got some people who are burnt out or on their way there. Um, if you're a large organization or you've got a, you know, 50, 100, uh, 500, 1,000 employees, mm. the impact of this, yes, on an individual level, it is huge. But organization wide, when you start looking at the productivity loss that mm. comes from this, it's a massive waste of money and potential right and it's money and the potential that you're already losing by doing nothing by maintaining the status quo by waiting another week yeah this is money that's already slipping out and this is why it's it, when we talk about opportunities when it comes to to wellness in the workplace you know one of the opportunities is you could stop the bleeding Right. You could mm -hmm. actually start to see, you know, not just, you know, the, the loss. Even of, if you slow the bleeding. Right. You'll still be ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So I think one thing. So I, I think I think we did a pretty decent job setting up the, the importance of the of, of wellness in the workplace and kind of the high level risk and opportunities. But I think it might be beneficial too, for us to kind of dig into some like warning signs for people mm -hmm. to kind of realize yeah. how serious this is in their workplace. And then maybe move on after that to kind of some opportunities. 
Um, so we have a short, like 15 minute on demand course on Roman three Academy, our learning portal, um, where we, where we talk about kind of the, the um, determining your vulnerability to presenteeism and absenteeism and disengagement. And so, um, but, but so in, 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 in these short courses and the one on um, burnout and presenteeism, we have like, a, we have a bunch of warning signs, but I think we'll talk about a couple of them here, just kind of drop them for people to start thinking about, because it's important for managers who are listening to start to identify these warning signs in their workplace, but also to the individuals going, is this me? Am, am I unknowingly burned, burn, 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 getting burned out? So it's also could be helpful reflective. But yeah, let, let, let's just share a couple of those. Um, and the first one I want to share is when staff develop a pattern of contributing less, mm -hmm. right? This, this can be kind of the present as, you know, people are, they're they're staying late or and, and um or sorry they're people who have normally participated in meetings or who are known for offering ideas kind of become quiet or start to consistently contribute less than they than they normally do it's like a slow degrade of their work quality and of their participation that could be a sign that they're not doing well a day or two here and there that's fine everyone's allowed to have an off day and off week but when it's a slow decline that's something that can be a big a big red flag. For many people, it may not actually impact their work quality, but if probably one of the best indicators that you need to investigate what's going on in your workplace is when your top performers become quiet, when yeah. good employees stop sharing, stop participating. That is such a massive red flag that there's something going on mm -hmm. because that doesn't generally happen for no reason right just a switch doesn't um, get pulled and oh all of a sudden somebody who was highly engaged and um participating in conversations and um you know sharing their opinions and thoughts and ideas when that if you have somebody who has been doing that like that's part of how they've engaged with work and that stops Mm -hmm. You need to take notice. Please take notice because there could be something substantial happening in your workplace, or maybe that person needs some uh, additional support. Uh, it, it is a warning sign of something needs to be investigated. Absolutely. Uh, another one. There's a, yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I was going to say uh, another one is um, workaholic employees. So whether that's you yourself are a workaholic, or there's an abundance, or there or there's a number of employees who are who have display kind of that workaholic attitude, and this is where they are always staying late. They're always responding to um, emails and requests, kind of when they're on vacation or after hours. They and and they really never really shut off, and. Again, this can be, you know, some people have a very high, you know, high dutifulness work ethic, but um, why they are doing this is, is is often important to investigate because some people, this, this is actually more rare, some people really uh, dig into their workplace and, and they really find some of the meaning and purpose in their job and, and, and it doesn't take a lot out of them to be this on all the time. Mm -hmm. But that is uh, probably not the most common situation. The most common situation is probably people don't feel like they can work less than this. Yes. The, the expectations on them are you have to always be on. You have to always be responding to to, to um, requests or, or emails that the, the place really will fall apart without you or or there's no ability for you to actually pass stuff off to other people that you have to just be working 24-7. Yeah. There's just no other option. And again, manager expectations has a huge role to play in this, right? Um, if you as a manager are somebody who um, falls into that first category where you are highly engaged in what you do and, you know, working into the evening, you know, responding to emails, texts, it doesn't really take a lot out of you. It's, it's part of how you, um, like, you have a thought at um, seven o'clock in the evening, so you send it out to your team. Great. That's good for you because it allows you to um, get your ideas down and get it off your chest, so to speak. However, you need to understand the impact that has on your team because mm -hmm. I <laughs> have gone through that uh, situation as an employee before where I had a manager who would be up at two o'clock in the morning sending emails. 
um, with their thoughts, with the random uh, whatever popped into their head at the moment. Now, unfortunately, the problem with that person was they expected to you, you to respond by 8 a.m. Um, <laughs> but the expectations that you have that you you can have unintended consequences from your actions, right? right? Are you inadvertently setting the expectation that people have to respond to your emails when you send them at seven o'clock in the evening? Are you setting the expectation that if you are working at seven o'clock that they should be working at the same time, right? This is what we want you to be considering is that it's not wrong to work hard. It's not wrong to work evenings and weekends to um, advance your career. However, you do... As a, especially as a manager or a supervisor, you need to understand how your actions will impact your team. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, I think one of my favorites uh, warning signs around this is kind of almost counterintuitive. Um, if you have suspiciously low absenteeism, that's something to take note of. You, because you may uninten unintentionally be creating unrealistic expectations about you, you uh, with your staff about their ability to take time off, right? All right. of these kind of play together. But if you, if your team never misses any time, mm -hmm. that's not usual. Yeah, like I, I, I know we talked. We've had this kind of conversation with clients where it's like. Well, you know, things are going pretty well. Our, you know, our, our wellness numbers are pretty are pretty good because look how low our sick day um, stats are. And we're always like, I don't think that means what you think that means. Hmm. Um, because again, just the, we need the, to pop up the Princess Bride meme there. <laughs> I don't think that means. <laughs> right. Yeah. But um, it, it, it's one of those things where you're. You know, it, again, it's, it's a bit counterintuitive. Like, oh, people aren't missing time. That's great. We're like, well, there's a possibility that they're not missing time because you really are taking care of everyone's mental, emotional, and physical health, right? But also, right. just you know, then there's also, but the, also consider like you know, just random flus or random like you know, random illnesses or just, just kind of stuff that kind of just comes up, especially at certain times of the year, right? But it's it, it tends to be more often than not about those unrealistic expectations around staff that they can't take time off. That's a sign of weakness to miss mm -hmm. time or that there's this like unintentional or there's this unspoken punishment that kind of comes with it too. Right. And these, and, and when we talk about, again, the emotional side of, of wellness, these are some good examples of the things that might indicate, you know, things not being done well on more, more on the emotional side, mm -hmm. right? Because again, if I feel like I, I, the pressure's on me, I can't, I can't ever turn off or I can't miss any time or like, you know, all the kind of stuff like that, those can be the kind of expectations that start to really rob the emotional health. Sure. I may have a treadmill and cells in the, in, in the staff room fridge, but if these are the expectations placed on me, then my wellness is going to be low. Yeah. I mean, also invest, like if you already have, if you are already providing wellness supports, understanding their usage, I mean, not individually who's using what, but if right. you have an EAP program an employee assistance program, if it's never being used, again, the question I would have is why is it not being used? Is it not actually meeting the needs of your employees or is it that people feel like they can't really take advantage of the uh, supports that you have in place. Yeah. And, and so one, and one thing that kind of we've been noticing a bit too, is so we've been doing a bit, a bit of work um, with a, a different kind of workplace kind of consultant. Like we, we have a, a program that we call Odin that's kind of helping um, consultants and, and um, business coaches kind of help bring this whole Workplace culture has a direct impact on performance and, and productivity um, kind of piece to their own consulting work. And we were, we were, we were engaging with a workplace wellness consultant who kind of in, who goes into workplaces and provides a lot of this stuff around like she provides stuff around like meditation and daily exercise and yoga mm -hmm. and those kinds of programs. And she has like in some workplaces, she has great success, a huge uptake, you know, noticeable like, you know, positive responses. But then in other workplaces, it just never takes off. And one thing that she really found helpful with using our program was realizing that there's, you know, that if you if you understand the culture of the workplace, the expectations placed on people, 
And if there is no psychological safety, if there is no consistency in how individual managers prioritize wellness, or there's no belonging and people are allowed to kind of be vulnerable and try new things, then these programs inserted without considering the culture that exists around it, they end up not being impactful because people don't really feel they can try yoga or they could, you know, or or, or, or they'd be vulnerable to, to, to look a little silly as they learn how to meditate. So it is important to really consider all of this stuff and how it all kind of plays together because, you know, the the culture and environment that you work in has a direct impact on the way you're going to use these programs. So if yeah. you bring in these people, if you bring in these health benefits, but you don't have a culture that normalizes people to be psychologically safe and, and show consistency and feel like they are connected and they're accepted and that they belong, then these programs may be great, but you will not have success with them because people need to feel like they're allowed, accepted it can be vulnerable enough to try them and use them. Yeah. And engaging with uh, a wellness consultant like that uh, can be a huge opportunity uh, for businesses, large and small. Again, going back to the very uh, beginning, uh, my first answer, one of the big opportunities you have right now is that most people, most organizations, most employers are not adequately providing for the physical, emotional, and mental health of their employees. Mo a lot of people are doing something, and mm -hmm. something is better than nothing. But most are not really taking a long-term view of it from that uh, preventative medicine perspective. And engaging with somebody who, an expert like that, who understands and can investigate your workplace culture or, you know, in provide solutions in the context of your workplace culture is a huge, huge asset. And I think these are the opportunities that we need to move into kind of sharing kind of before we, we end this discussion. Because again, like you talked about the, the health benefits, if they're not being used, then, you know, then, then that's a big, but that's another big red flag, right? So maybe we need to be doing more, more um, intentional health benefit reviews. I mean, we need to be doing more focus groups with employees to find out what are they going to actually, well, not, not only what they need, but what do they want? Yeah. Right? What are going to be the things that will actually make a difference? Even the, even the kind of normalizing kind of the discussions around the struggles that we have, you know, individually and allow people to kind of be a little bit more vulnerable and they talk about what they need to kind of be successful in their role to kind of help the kind of accommodations, those kinds of normalize those discussions as well. Yeah, I mean, there's lots that we need to be, there's lots to do, like there's lots of work that needs to be done in the wellness space, mm -hmm. but there's also, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, there are a lot of people who are trying to help you solve these problems. Uh, and our biggest advice is to look at it as, not as individual siloed pieces or not to forget that it is the physical emotional and mental health of your uh, employees that is really the point. And I think you articulated it really well that the way your workplace culture, the expectations that you place on people, the way that your managers engage with their teams, um, these things are going to have a significant influence over the emotional side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, well, I mean, that's just something I mean, it, it all kind of plays together. This is the whole idea of not looking at them at, at a silo yeah. because like, again, th there's so much that plays off each other, right? Especially if someone suffers from, you know, like um, from anxiety, then, like, you know, then having expect clear expectations and kind of any kind of transparency and, you know, normalizing, you know, struggles and accommodations that makes th them have a lot less that will trigger anxiety in them which will uh, benefit their mental health and, and benefit their their emotional health but then there are also things too like you mentioned a lot of things today like you know, let people unplug when yeah. you have those when the managers have those great email uh, email ideas they want to send them out don't send them out at 2 a.m set an email delay so they don't get delivered into people's inboxes till say nine o'clock the next morning allow for people to not you know don't fill up their inbox during off hours yeah. um yeah incorporate more autonomy into the workplace, allowing people to have more freedom over their schedule and over the way that, that they do their work by maybe even shifting towards a more results measurements of success than time measurements of success. But I think the one thing we talked to, we did a podcast 
at the end of last season where we talked about performative expectations mm-hmm. and or, or, st- stop with the theater stop with having to pretend that you're working when your manager walks by so they know that you're working and stop expecting success to look like people busy you know when you when you're looking yeah. at them stop the keystroke measure soft um, uh, measurement pieces right let's you know like stop expecting people to perform um productivity rather than actually be productive because i mean that performative expectation of oh no my manager walked by and i wasn't having my notes to the grindstone for that for those three seconds and now I'm, that's gonna end up in my performance review right the, those types of, yeah. of situations that has to just flat out stop yeah i think the productivity theater piece like it's directly relevant to the whole conversation that we've had around presenteeism burnout quiet quitting because it's it happens because of your expectations yeah right it, it does it it happens because of the expectations that are placed on employees now yeah sure one in a hundred might be because somebody's tired or lazy and you know just going through the motions but also why is that happening um but the the performative piece especially with uh, managers who um are take a more taskmaster approach uh mm-hmm. to their management style it's just it doesn't work anymore just it's it's time to look at how do we do things differently how do we actually provide for the health and wellness of the people who are in our charge and we need to start understanding that management, uh, that leadership, that management role is about taking care of those in your charge. You need to right. take care of them so that they can perform the business outcomes that's going to allow your position to be successful and your company to be successful. Absolutely. I think this was, this was a, a great conversation. So I think I'll just do a quick wrap up. Um. So... The question was, what are some risks and opportunities with wellness in the workplace? Well, there's been this rise since kind of the the onset of COVID around wellness and burnout as major workforce topics. It's always been something that we've needed to discuss and find solutions for, but but we haven't really prioritized it the way that we have needed to, um, or, or at least the way that we do now, kind of since 2019. So the idea is, is that this, but this has always been an important topic. Like we have stats that say that the um, an employee takes an average of four sick days a year, but admits to being unproductive at work an average of 57.5 days a year. So this has always been important. But when employees feel like they have to show up and at work, even though they're sick or they're unproductive or they're not going to be able to, they don't have the, they don't have it in them mentally, emotionally, or physically to do the job. We call this presenteeism. And it's one of those things where presenteeism and burnout go go hand in hand. But maybe we need to be looking at wellness through a different lens. Maybe we need to be considering, you know, employee wellness with the same type of priority and investment and resources behind it as we do maintenance departments in our organizations. Like if we invested in maintaining our people, same when we invested in maintaining our vehicles, for example, we might actually start to see that, you know, taking care of of our assets and and allowing them to have what they need to get the best use and not be and not be burnt out is something that would be maybe allow us to shift the way that we think about the workplace but there are warning signs that we need to be aware of for ourselves and for our employees um, and our coworkers of signs of burnout and presenteeism that staff develop a pattern of contributing less your high performers start to slowly kind of fade kind of fade into the background when you have suspiciously low absenteeism, that sounds like a good thing, but if people don't feel like they can actually be sick or take the time off, then that can be a very, very bad thing. Yeah. When you have workaholic employees who who would normally um, would present you know, a very high performance, but it's, maybe it's because they don't feel like they can do anything less than kill themselves every day just to, just to be productive because that, that's expectations placed upon them. There is an actual cost associated with ignoring burnout and ignoring the different aspects of wellness. That burnout related absences and loss of productivity can be close to 25% of an employee's annual salary. That is the money we are already spending and losing and wasting. That if we started to direct some solutions 
we could we, we could slow that bleed of this uh, of these absences and loss of productivity because of burnout if we really started to, be, to provide some preventive medicine. But there are some opportunities that allow us to kind of get ahead of our of our competitors, allow us to start to make some small changes that will support the physical, mental, and emotional health. Things like we should be looking at our health benefits, reviewing them, making sure that they're actually doing the job that they're supposed to. We should be normalizing breaks, admitting you know admitting when we're struggling, allowing for accommodations to become a normal part of our workplace. We should let people unplug. We should you know spend more time trying to encourage more autonomy in the work, and we need to really stop with performative expectations. But probably the biggest piece is we don't want to do a big sweeping solution where we try and real look at all these things in silos because burnout and wellness are really more about the little everyday actions. Wellness has often chipped away a little bit every day. So a big sweeping once a year solution is not going to solve those problems, but solutions that build and strengthen wellness a little bit every day. That's going to be how you sustain that type of um, improvement and how you counteract the the burnout that is, is kind of going to be abundant in workplaces if you don't start taking this stuff seriously. All right. Yeah. That's so, great. so that about does it for us. For a full archive of our podcast and access to the video version hosted on our YouTube channel, visit roman3.ca slash podcast. Thanks for joining us. For more information on topics like these, don't forget to visit us at roman3.ca. Side effects of this podcast may include improved retention, high productivity, increased market share, employees breaking out in spontaneous dance, dry mouth, aversion to the sound of James's voice, desire to find a better podcast.